Tim, this is the third time we're chatting. Super, super lucky for you. Uh, lucky, for that that lucky for you. <laughs> <laughs> lucky for you. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Look, as a young medic, I'm not going to try and uh, hazard a guess as to how long ago that was, but your junior doctor diet was probably similar to mine, right? You were, you know, just snatching sandwiches and having sugary juices and all the rest of it. What do you think are some of the harmful foods that even today people are still consuming every day, particularly for like, let's say breakfast, that are actually leading them to put on weight and are damaging for the metabolic health and, and their and the brains? I think there are plenty of foods that we're being fooled by. Yeah. Uh, breakfast is a great example because virtually every breakfast cereal Clay has all kinds of health claims on the packet, all kinds of added vitamins and things you don't need, and doesn't tell you that it's they're made. It's fake food made in factories that contain virtually none of the original nutrients of those plants. So, you know, and that also goes for most of the mueslis and things that you know. I used to think were quite healthy when I sort of switched from, I don't know, Rice Krispies or, or you know, a, a, from kids' food to yeah. what was grown-up food. I said, oh, let's go to um, Special K or to mm. uh, All Bran or to, um, you know, some more expensive mueslis. Yeah. But when you actually look at them, they are really just full of accessible carbs that will give you a sugar spike mm. and not much in the way of fiber. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing like that makes a dent on the 30 grams of fiber that you, you need every day. So that was, so the, the cereals are, you know, the biggest thing in the UK, particularly kids are, are given and you get into this habit and, and you're sort of told they're healthy. Yeah. Um, then I think you've got porridge is another one. So. I was always told porridge was healthy. My mum would sort of give me Quaker oats or something like this. As a, and, you know, when I was researching the book, it was a bit of a, an eye-opener to me that there was a huge difference between the different porridges and that anything you can make instantly means that those sugars are accessible instantly. And so they'll just as quick as it is to make, those sugars that come out into your body and give you a sugar surge mm. uh, whereas if you bother doing slow cooking overnight cooking that's going to be a high fiber low sugar alternative so huge differences and most people can't be bothered to do the overnight oats so they, yeah. they go for the other one and oats has a huge great pr thing saying it's brilliant and it lowers your cholesterol and it's all rubbish mm. uh, they're not good for you um so and then, of course, orange juice, which beloved by uh, myself when I was younger. I, used, yeah. and I gave it to my kids, you know, gallons of Tropicana, <laughs> you know, thinking, oh, this is, tastes so good and it's amazingly healthy. It's, you know, my vitamin C levels must be you know, through the roof here. Fantastic. But, you know, it has the same effect on, on your blood sugar as Coca-Cola. And you wouldn't really think of giving you and the kids Coca-Cola in the morning. So... Mm. I think that then you've got, you know, classical toast and marmalade, which most of the breads people are eating in this country are high in carbs and low in fiber. They've got some fiber, so mm -hmm. I don't want to completely diss them. Sure. But we're tempted by anything that was slightly dyed brown by the industry to think, that, oh, look, it's brown bread. <laughs> I'm, I'm superior to those people that only like white bread. But actually, you know, you just add a bit of uh, carrot extract or something to make it a bit browner or yellower and people are suckered into that. Mm. And so very few breads have a decent fiber ratio that mm. counteracts the amount of sugar you're getting. Mm. So I think that's the, the you know, th that's where I m made a big change to my diet. And, and I think the other thing, that uh, I used to regularly, you know, 
eat was the sort of meal deal, mm. uh, as most doctors would do nowadays. I mean, I now, now that hospital meals. canteens are generally gone or yeah. take the queues too long or whatever. Yeah. And hospitals have now got these shops in them they didn't used to. Um, yeah, getting this meal deal with what I thought was a healthy um, sandwich, you know, mm. again, made in a factory, uh, mass produced. Uh, and actually, if you look at the ingredients, not only is this sort of fake brown bread really high in, in sugar and low in fiber, uh, but the ingredients and the mayonnaise and the sauce, whether it's, you know, you've got, I used to like prawn or, you know, uh, prawn mayonnaise, that sounded super healthy because fish is good for you. It makes you brainy. and it, um, Or it was tuna and sweet corn, you know. I was, I was always saying, oh, this must be the healthy option. And, you know, when I started putting a glucose monitor on me <clears throat> when I was eating this stuff, I was absolutely horrified, mm. you know, and I had that with my orange juice and my crisps, which you get for your meal deal. Yeah. And my blood sugar went up to 11. Gosh. You know, I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. And so not surprising I was getting that afternoon slump uh, after that big sugar spike. So, you know, and this was me as a medic, supposedly, you know, above average intelligence, should have more health knowledge. Mm. And you still see plenty of people, plenty of medics still ignorant of this today. And I think this is the, you know, we're talking to, you know, perhaps five or 10% of the population, but 90% um, have still got no clue that this mm. stuff is making them tired, making them, you know, giving them brain fog making them hungrier so they're putting on weight and messing up their gut microbes and yeah. i think this is you know the real motivation for you know me talking about this you talking about this you know why we want to change things and show there are different ways of eating and how disastrous this has been and you know there was the we're finally admitting the nhs is broken and our healthcare system is broken finally we've got a government that is talking the truth, mm -hmm. uh, despite putting lots of money into it. And um, a lot of that is because we've not been talking about prevention for the last 15 years at all. For sure. And if you basically f fill people with foods that are poisoning them, you're gonna get many more health problems than other countries. And mm. so the, the pressure on our service has been uh, terrible you know, and the system has not been coping anyway and we just need to start rethinking this because it's costing us an estimated 90 billion pounds a year whilst the food companies are making 30 billion pounds profit from us mm, mm. and that's you know that's sort of half of the nhs um expenditure yeah is what we're spending because of bad food and all the estimates are if we change our food from the worst habits to the best, we can reduce the burden of all these diseases, all the chronic disease of aging by about 70 to 80%. Mm. So huge potential gains just by educating people and changing the food environment. You, you, uh, what you're referring to, I guess, is the, um, the Darcy report, the report that literally just came out today. Um, and one of the stark things that you, you mentioned was the degree of investment that's actually been increasing, even allowing for COVID year on year, despite what's uh, a failing system uh, by every metric imaginable. And I think that lack of focus on prevention is surely to blame. Part of the issue, I guess, is that food landscape, what you just described there in a hostel setting of those little shops with the meal deals, I think is basically on every single high street. And even when people move from becoming problem unaware to problem aware, they still struggle to make the changes. You know, there's a lot of you know my colleagues who still work in a &E and hostile environments. Like, well, there's no other option that I don't really know what I can do. How do you think we get to those people who are actually problem aware, which is still probably the minority across the population, but at least, you know, galvanizing that change and, and getting them to vote with their where they put their pounds? 
Well, it's difficult because people are busy and, you know, if you're surrounded by f- these sort of fast food outlets mm. that are offering you a nice sandwich, you know, and you've only got five minutes yeah. and there's no healthy alternative other than ultra processed food, uh, you can see why people do that. Um, so, you know, we've got to start changing the food environment and the easiest thing for a government to do would be to say, well, you know, the government owns and the taxpayer own hospitals. You've got to have rules to say in hospital, you have to have some uh, certain levels of non-ultra processed food. And mm. we shouldn't be, we should be bringing that down both for patients and staff because most of the staff in the NHS are obese, uh, far less healthy than the average population because they are in a terrible food environment. Mm. And as you say, it's not always their fault because they're busy and they have got nowhere else to go. In other countries, I mean, I've worked in you know, a few other countries, Australia, Belgium, Spain. People bring in their their food themselves much more than they do in this country and we provide spaces for them and facilities yeah. for them to do that and they bring a tupperware you know from their their evening meal they'd have cooked and so that's a sort of mentality we need to start changing while there's still a terrible food environment I, yeah. i'd love us to have proper salad bars and nice food you, you know real food in 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 hospitals and and government facilities but you can imagine that's not going to happen anytime soon because at the moment these these shops are propping up those hospitals giving them valuable income yeah. which they you know they would otherwise all the you know the, fo- the walls will be falling down mm. so that's what we have to sort of that's what we're dealing with but i think if you started with the catering of the patients for example and some hospitals as you know across yeah. the country do a good job yeah but the vast majority don't. So let's just make, you know, let's get West Streeting to say, let's have a rule here that across the NHS, you know, no more than 10% ultra processed food like Mediterranean countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And down from our, you know, 60%, yeah. which uh, is absolutely crazy. And look after your staff, look after the patients. But I think it's changed the mentality, it's changed the mindset. It's realizing that just by grabbing that that sandwich, that meal, if you do that on a regular basis, you know you'll be gaining a kilo a year, and you will feel more tired, more depressed, uh, more unwell. And there is an, there is a solution, and that is preparing your meals yourself and bringing them in. I think, mm. uh, and 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 employers helping people because yeah. they'll have better staff that are you know more energetic, more motivated. It makes absolute sense from everyone. They'll be less sick. They won't, you know, won't uh, have as many health problems. But it's getting that message across um, yeah. in this sort of crisis type scenario where every doctor I know at the moment is just, you know, feels so much under pressure. It's not the thing they're thinking about. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm, I'm a fan of these devices that bring to the forefront what's actually going on when you consume these products during the day, um, specifically talking about continuous glucose monitors and, and getting that real-time feedback on your your blood glucose. Um, I guess w- one of the things that came to my mind when I started doing some work with one of the major catering groups and trying to revamp some of the NHS hospital canteens is, like you said, so much money goes into NHS hospitals from these outlets that are essentially selling fast food, ultra processed food, mm. the Greggs, the Costas, the Starbucks. You, it's almost like, you know, a caricature of every single hospital. You have the same people, the same outlets, and this is what people rely on. And it's also kind of what they demand as well. That's a lot of the pushback that I've had in the past. I guess my question is, now, you, now you're aware of the damaging impacts of your old breakfast of, you know, your marmalade and juice and special K. I mean, it sounds just like my uh, my breakfast back in the day, 20 years ago. Um, what, do, what do you have for breakfast now to improve your, you know, your 
blood glucose, but also protect against metabolic issues and, and brain fog and, and brain disease. Just a quick one. If you're enjoying this kind of content, you will love our free newsletter called Seasonal Sundays. It goes into depth on a seasonal ingredient every Sunday. And we talk about the nutritional medicine benefits, the research and the culinary uses of an ingredient every Sunday with recipes included. You can get access to the free newsletter in the link just down below. Well, some days like today, I haven't had any breakfast apart okay. from what I call the Italian breakfast, which is an espresso. Yeah. <laughs> um, which uh, apparently doesn't count for fasting, so that's that's fine. Um, Does it not? Does it, was there controversy around that? Um, some controversy, yes. It's it's obviously rather hard to test. Sure. Yeah. Uh, completely, <laughs> but um, I'm a big fan of saying you're allowed black tea or black coffee. Yeah. Um, because it's not really stimulating the glucose sensors mm -hmm. uh, at all and allows you, you know, to not feel like you're punishing yourself. Sure. Uh, so a lot of the time, I, you know, I'll either skip breakfast or have it late on. So mm -hmm. if, if I'm in, I'm at home, I'm working at home, then I would probably have my a breakfast or a brunch after 11. Yeah. And... Classically, my go-to breakfast has changed to um, the high full-fat yogurt, 50-50 with milk kefir. Okay. And um, whichever berries I've got or fruit I've got in the fridge, if I haven't, I get some frozen berries out, out of the freezer. And a nut and seed mix. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a really nice nut granola in the in the recipe book that I'm now using. Mm. I, I do big batches of that, and I absolutely love it. Or if I if I'm somewhere else, I will take my Zoe Daily Thirty and sprinkle that on as well. Mm. So making sure that you know breakfast, although you know it's quite nice to skip it or delay it, is a really good opportunity to put those good things into your into your diet. When you're really in control, yeah, yeah. When you're at home, you've got it all. Whereas you don't always, you know, if you're busy, like we are, you don't always know where you're going to be the rest of the time. So that's what I like to do. And it, and I found that, you know, I'm filled up much more, and I'm not super hungry at lunchtime now. I don't have that. I used to have these sort of ten thirty, eleven o'clock dips, mm. or I've got to have a. I'm desperate. I've got to have a chocolate biscuit. Yeah. And, you know, or I've got to have a Twix or, you know, I mean. I remember those. <laughs> yeah. And that was because, you know, of my carby breakfast had given me this spike and then a dip. And then I was obviously looking for yet another sort of fix to, to get it back there again and don't have that at all. Mm. So really high fat breakfast really and high, high fat, high protein breakfast really suit me. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I could never go back. And I sort of occasionally I'm in hotels and they've got, you know, some British hotels are terrible. They've got, you know, awful. And, you know, might have a some muesli and, a you know, a sip of orange juice. I said, how could I have ever eaten that? Yeah. You know, it's like the worst setup for the day. It's weird when you when you when you go and stay in a hotel these days uh, and you see what's on offer for the breakfast, you know, continental breakfast, croissant, jam toast all that kind of stuff and you see people you know no judgment at all but like just going for it as you would do because it is quote unquote normal but now through the lens of how intuitive you are about what's actually going to happen a couple of hours down the line you completely change your perspective on that and so have i like i can't think of the last time i've indulged in croissants for breakfast you know i i mean i've had croissants but never first thing in the morning because i just know how crap i'm going to feel in a couple of hours time what do you what do you make of the sort of pushback against this idea that glucose spikes are um responsible for the dips and the lows and you know how much of a fuss that some people who are as respected uh, are saying you know what it's not all about blood glucose we shouldn't we shouldn't be obsessing with blood, about blood glucose as much what, what do you what do you make of, of that well i think i'm in the middle ground i mean you know, through the studies we've done with Zoe, we've seen that, yeah, blood sugar has an effect. But we know that um, blood fats have a bigger effect on inflammation, for mm. example. 
And uh, we also know that feeding your gut microbiome also has an important effect, as does you know time restricted eating. So I think you've got to take a holistic view of it mm. and realize that also we found a tenfold difference between people's blood sugar responses. So some people it really doesn't matter that much. You know, some people, lucky buggers, can can have a croissant. And it doesn't, you know, my wife is one of them, you mm. know, so, so she eat a croissant. She doesn't really get a, a big sugar spike. Yeah. Um, and I get a massive one. So, you know, we shouldn't be demonizing sugar for everybody. And we also shouldn't, you know, delicious foods like croissants, you know, every now and again, if I'm in France and there's yeah. a fantastic hotel breakfast, I'm not going to say no. Sure. Yes, they don't have anything else, but, you know, you've got to take those pleasures in life. It doesn't mean you have to have it every day. Mm. So, yeah, I, I think we've got to realize that, we, again, we mustn't fall into the trap of reductionism to think that it's only about glucose mm. and that it's all about this balance and that probably if you've got your, your gut sorted out, you know, you can tolerate mm. the occasional burst of glucose better than you could when you were in this really bad state of swinging around all the time. So mm -hmm. yeah, be aware of it, but it's not the it's not the only thing that matters. And I think everything in science and medicine always tells us it's more complicated sure, than yeah. we first think. So someone comes to, oh yes, <clears throat> you know, it's all about gluten or or it's all about lectins or it's all about, you know, glucose or about protein. Well, no, it, it never is. Mm. So it's a factor, but we shouldn't be absolutely obsessed with it. And, you know, there are some, there will be some good foods that have bad GI effects. And I was, I was there's one of them uh, at the moment that, that on Zoe, we don't score very well because it's, it's quite a sugary, starchy vegetable, a beetroot. Oh, right. Um, Cause it's, you know, it, it's quite sugary. Yeah, I mean, you, you use beet cane, don't you? That's yes, how you... it's a sort of form of sugar in sure, a way. Yeah. Um, but we know that it's got many other properties yeah. that um, uh, is good for blood vessels. It's more potent than salt reduction in reducing blood pressure. Um, you know, it's been used in, you know, erectile dysfunction and, all kind, you know, mm. so it has the other properties and it that and it's got lots of polyphenols in it because mm. obviously from its color. So if you only went on the sugar, you'd say, well, actually, I could never have beetroot. Yeah. And you'd be missing out a lot. So that's there are some good examples in nature of why we mustn't be too rigid and uh, reductionist on yeah. this. And that's why I want people to learn more about everything about food and uh, and all the different structures and things because it's complicated and you you can't just have a single parameter yeah exactly I, mean, I guess you know using the same analogy as your wife and, and other people who are lucky in the sense that they don't get that big glucose rise it doesn't mean that they can just eat all the refined carbs they want because eventually it's going to catch up with them it will you know damage their microbiota or they won't feed their microbiota so overall it's gonna gonna have a negative impact we know that yeah, because they won't be getting the fiber as well. So again, but if you only focused on the sugar, yeah, that's totally. right. You'd miss that nuance mm. and say, well, okay, what's the reason it's not good f for you? Yes, it won't make them feel as bad, mm. but long term, uh, they're, they're going to get negative effects as well. But it it just means they don't have to be quite as, uh, you know, picky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think just, you know, this idea that we did have this tenfold difference between people is mm. still quite an amazing fact. And even, yeah. even identical twins having different responses to sugars should make us a bit circumspect about sort of demonizing all food, you know, yeah. anything with a GI score above this level or below yeah. this level. Um, everything in context, you know, and mm. I think that that's really important. This tenfold difference if you could hazard a guess, I know in biology nothing's certain, but if you could hazard a guess as what is having the biggest impact on that variability, is it come down mainly to the microbiota differences? Is it other things like, I know, stress state, sleep, the sort of like 
the speed at which they ate the food? What, where would you place your chips as to, you know, where you think it's what's having the biggest impact? There was no dominant factor when we did try and break it down. Um, there were multiple factors that had small effects. Mm -hmm. um, genes were still important. Okay. But they only accounted for 30% of the differences. Okay. I think the next biggest was uh, microbiome. Mm -hmm. Then it was the sort of meal composition itself. So you could sort of say, well, you know, where there were proteins and fats in there. There was also the previous meal. Mm. There was also your sleep. Okay. And whether you exercise. So all these things have a, a role that yeah. it would take a huge ton of experiments to, to sort out. Mm. So I don't think there's sort of one factor that, that determines it. And it, it it probably can vary a little bit from one day to another. Mm. You know, again, depending if you've had a different sleep or, you know, we have people who sometimes repeat their Zoe test and say, well, my, you know, I'm different now. Mm. Um, you know, and some people it's because they've taken antibiotics in the meanwhile, or they're doing less exercise or more exercise. Um, you know, it's not, it's not fixed for life. Yeah. 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 And we don't know. Some people might, as their microbiome improves, they might get better responses. Others actually might get more sensitive. You mm. know, we're, we're not, we still don't really understand all about it. Yeah. You, you mentioned lectins there. I've got to ask you about lectins. This is one of my bugbears. A lot of people ask me about lectins online and I have to keep on giving the same answer again and again and again because there is this sort of... Is it still around? I oh, thought... it's still around in a big way, a big oh, way. God. I get a lot of messages about this, a lot of DMs. Yeah, I would say weekly I'm asked about lectins. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on lectins? I know I, I don't even want to be discussing it, but it keeps on coming up again and again. Well, it's quite simple. Really. It's complete rubbish. <laughs> um, you know, any sort of influencer can come up with a theoretical reason that one chemical in some foods or plants has uh, a theoretical negative effect on something and then make a career out of it. Sure. And some people have done a brilliant job in demonizing... Uh, you know, this compound lectin because it they call it an anti-nutrient sure. um, because you know, in theory it might stop you absorbing some of the other nutrients in the, in that food uh, in reality if there is an effect it's pretty trivial compared to the benefits of eating that food mm. and what no one what everyone should be asking is well show us the randomized controlled trial in humans that shows that people who cut out eating high lectin foods are healthier. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether it, you know, it's gluten, whether it's lectin, whether it's um, some uh, possible carcinogen or, or, or whatever someone's talking about at the moment. You know, either those studies have shown no difference mm. or they've shown a benefit of, of eating that food. So there's plenty... Massive studies have shown that people eating high lectin foods like beans and pulses have reduced heart disease, increased uh, longevity. So yeah. these are just, you know, essentially people out to make a reputation because, you know, they're not scientists. And mm -hmm. so they just pick on something and, um, well, tell them, do the proper science. Yeah. Uh, come back and talk about it. Stop talking about theoretical problems that stop people eating real foods mm -hmm. so yeah I, I i too get get angry about it and similar ones about seed oils and yeah you know, these sort of things they're they're based on hot air mm. and people just need to say okay show us the trials in humans not in mice um you know if it all stacks up if the epidemiology stacks up with the randomized trials and maybe supported by animal data yeah, then you might believe it. Sure. Yeah. You know, like we have with artificial sweeteners, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not conclusive, but we've got pretty much overwhelming evidence from many sources to show that they're not good for us. Mm. But, um, yeah, um, we need to stop this sort of 
infighting in a way because it's a bit like I don't know the you know the Trotskyists attacking the sort of Leninists when you know the fascists are taking over. Yeah. You know, um, I do wish the the sort of food people would, would just attack the real enemy, which yeah. is junk food and fake food. Yeah, and stop attacking. You know, the, anyone who's trying to promote real food. Yeah, it's almost like if you were a conspiracist, you'd probably imagine that the food industry is probably behind the misinformation that actually leads people attention, their attention to go, oh, well, beans are bad for me, I've heard, or, you know, these kind of oils are bad for me, I've heard. And so the, your attention goes there, whereas actually it should be on well, what is the, the matrix of your entire diet? You know, how much of it is ultra processed and how can we move you from from highly processed to less processed and ultimately, you know, minimally or zero processed. Well, it's quite possible that these people are uh, sponsored by the food industry. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, if you look at the, the the US records of what Coca-Cola did like 20 years ago, <clears throat> they promoted all these influences and researchers to say that if only children in schools were exercising more, um, you wouldn't have an obesity problem. Mm. It was, you know, to distract from the fact that they're eating all the, drinking all these uh, products that are making them uh, obese and diabetic. And it's now well proven that uh, exercise isn't going to help children uh, who are drinking Coca-Colas and junk food mm -hmm. at all. And that was a brilliant distracting device. And they paid for all kinds of research and influences. So it's quite possible that these these attacks on on real food are coming from the food industry, who obviously make have no interest in making beans in jars or cans because it's very low, you know, uh, make no money on that because mm. it's they much rather create some fake food. Yeah. So I think that's a good point. Um, we should look at the the funding of some of these people. Yeah. Um, you know, and who's paying for their publicity and their um all these other things and yeah i'm highly suspicious of, of lots of attacks or alternate theories yeah yeah because you ask yeah okay they might sell a book but some people don't even have books to sell they just got this theory yeah yeah it, it is pretty remarkable and i guess like from your perspective as well you're now you're in the public eye in quite a big way you're probably used to getting attacks just from all sort of angles. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, obviously it's quite unnerving and it must be uncomfortable. It's more uncomfortable for my family. They get upset sure, <coughs> yeah. when I get nasty uh, tweets or, um, so, you know, I generally mute the, the people that I don't want so I don't see them or, you know, or, and I, I tend to look less at, at Twitter or X than I used to anyway. Yeah. Um, but even on Instagram, you get some comments. I, I realize that some of them are directly paid by the food industry. Ah. Um, some are disgruntled uh, academics uh -huh. that have made it their career to attack me and, and Zoe and you know, have their own PR companies now, probably paid by the food industry mm. to it, particularly if I'm attacking ultra processed foods mm. or, or whatever, because they they now see Zoe and me as the same and therefore uh, a reasonable target. Um, I did something on, it was interesting, like it can go into other fields. I, I, I had a tweet that went viral about sunscreens. Oh yeah. Um, I said people don't need to wear sunscreen year round. Okay. Um, it's complete madness and, and, and bad for your skin. Uh -huh. and you know, we all need vitamin D mm. and, uh, and supplementation, you know, and I'd, I'd said previously supplementation is, is a waste of time. Mm. And three million people or, or whatever got this and everybody laid into me, uh, these influencers who are peddling sunscreens to young women year round uh, on TikTok and ever. So, uh, and, you had celebrities weighing in. I had, I don't know, Jay Rayner. I had, um, wow. um, what's his name? The, uh, um, the, 
the doc, um, the gynecology doctor who wrote the books. Um, I don't know. I, I try and spend as little time anyway, as I can. Anyway, as people so who, who know nothing about yeah. the subject. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been studying vitamin D for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. My wife is a melanoma expert. Uh -huh. um, and everything I said was absolutely true. So, and then the, the newspapers all piled in. And you realize that actually the sun cream industry are, are paying these medical charities to promote this stuff. Mm. And there's absolutely no evidence that it reduces aging, which is what they're sort of, Saying, oh, there's no evidence. No evidence. It reduces aging. There's wow. no decent. And eventually, the British Association of Dermatologists came out and said, "Well, he's actually right. You know, why would you tell young women living in in England in in midwinter to wear, to wear SPF 30 um, or, as an extra layer on their skin all year round? So that they are, you know, most of their lives." wearing an SPF 30 in a country like the UK mm. and then being told they have to take vitamin supplements on top of that. Yeah. And yeah. This, this is all paid for by the, the industry and promoting and whatever. So that's, that's a sort of other example of how we're influenced by <clears throat> these big corporations mm. and how they can, you know, th they have posters, you know, they're supporting posters by skin charities. Um, as if it's coming from the official bodies and mm. you know you've got the food industry doing the same with you know the british nutrition foundation and all kinds of <coughs> quasi uh seemingly charitable organizations paid completely by the food industry and um we've just you know we just need to wake up yeah and realize that everything we're being told is not actually you know independent advice Aside from how uncomfortable it is, obviously, for your family when that oh. kind of stuff happens, how I, do you ground yourself it, when you're, let's say, before the um, the, the, the official body uh, of dermatology actually comes to your defense? How do you ground yourself when everyone is attacking you from newspapers to other academics, et cetera, et cetera? Like, well, I guess I've got quite a thick skin, and I think. I would have reacted quite differently 20 years ago. Sure. Um, if I didn't have that experience, if I hadn't written 900 papers, and if I didn't feel I was confident to talk in all these these subjects. Um, so it doesn't worry me too much because I'm confident of the facts I know. Mm -hmm. And you know, in that case, I also had a, a world expert as my wife to ask. I said, did I say anything wrong? You know. She said, "No, no, it's it's fine." But you should have asked me before, because right? <laughs> she's getting a lot of flack. But you know, um, so you know, I was impulsive, but everything I said was actually fine. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So I realise it's part of the job now. Sure. Yeah. I have to rattle the cage a bit, mm -hmm. and if I'm going to rattle the cage, you're going to get uh, people attacking you. Yeah. Um, but you know, most people I meet, you know will come up and shake my hand and say, thank you, you're doing a great job. So yeah. that makes me carry on. Yeah. Um, but I think I can see why uh, it would totally intimidate someone younger. Mm. And probably my younger self wouldn't be doing this. Mm. I'd back off as soon as uh, the heat got too much, which is exactly what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good to know. Um, let's talk about the, the book in a bit more detail. Uh, because your book is really about abundance rather than, you know, taking things out of your diet, even though we started off this podcast with that. Um, what do you think people need to start eating more of? And I, I can almost hear the answer in my head already, um, but perhaps with specific reference to ingredients that you're really big fans of. Right. Um, yeah, well, as you know, this book came out of the, the sort of theoretical book Food for Life, which mm -hmm. took me six years to write, yeah. this A to Z of food we've discussed. And in it, I was sort of discussing the evidence for all these, these ingredients that we don't eat nearly enough of mm -hmm. that have these amazing properties. And um, it, But it was rather abstract, so it was really good to, to sort of take those abstract views and say, this is how you can actually do it. This is 100 examples mm -hmm. of recipes that have... Uh, lots of different plants in it, lots of polyphenols in it, um, 
lots of amazing flavors with interesting swaps that you might not have thought about. Mm -hmm. So it's it's often about swapping what you're mentally would think about. So um, swapping white rice, which although super tasty, and I know you're you're a rice fan. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> sorry to say that, but you know the fact that bulgur wheat, uh, quinoa, um, you know barley do an equally good job but mm. are so much more healthy mm. and f actually filling um is really interesting and so recipes that show you sort of just get you into that yeah using those alternate grains that are higher in protein higher in fiber mm -hmm. um as alternatives and, and sort of saying well actually brown rice doesn't really cut it okay. you know? um yeah. although many people think it does you know it's, it's a bit like brown bread you know it's that sort of oh it must be healthier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the other, there's quite a few recipes that feature mushrooms. Mm. I'm a big fan of mushrooms, not only as, you know, source of vitamin D if they've been sunbathing um, in your, but also, you know, as if you're trying to wean yourself off meat, a fantastic alternative, mm. umami flavored. Um, then there's, we're going to be chatting about mushrooms soon, I think, in a couple of weeks. You're on a panel with me. <laughs> are we, are we, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I think so, anyway. Fungi, yeah. fungi panel. The fungi panel, yeah. <laughs> the fun panel. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we don't eat enough mushrooms. Yeah. And people are often a bit frightened of cooking them and yeah. doing these things. So It's so easy to grow as well. They're, they're delicious. There's so many varieties. And, yeah, they're incredibly good for us. And they have... You know, because they're not plants, mm. they've got a different structure. And so it's quite likely that, you know, all those nutrients will be quite different to the ones you're getting from your other foods. So mm. I think we should be eating much more mushroom dishes, you know, yeah. regularly uh, during the week. Did you uh, say they're well not the, plants? They're not plants, no. Well, let's let's double click on that. Uh, how, are they, how are they not plants? They're their own kingdom, the fungi. So they're actually... Genetically, they're closer to uh, animals than to plants. That's yeah. going to be shocking for a lot of people. Would say that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, people think a bit pedantic when you if you say they're not plants because mm. you know, well, they look like plants. Yeah. They grow in the <laughs> ground, but I think we've got to treat them a bit more respect. Mm. And you know, they are absolutely incredible um species that will out survive humans mm. and you know they have these in these connections under the ground that they they estimate as about a third of the the world and are really responsible for soil um the health of the soil as well so you need this mix of the microbes in the soil but you've got all these networks of fungi that are communicating with each other so uh, you know, learning great respect for yeah. for fungi, and I, th I think you know we're starting to see how they're they benefiting people uh, going through chemotherapy mm. uh, as adjuvant therapies. Um, some of this these mushroom teas are, which I thought were rubbish when I first heard about them. There's some evidence that you know they have some clinical benefit. Uh, so I think we. We need to really look much more at this whole space, and th these can be incredible medicinal foods, mm. you know, which the, you know, the Chinese have been using for ages. Yeah. But I think we're now starting to do proper clinical trials, and um, uh, you know, particularly cancer, you know, cancer and immune system, uh, they're really, really important. But you know, I love the taste, and you know, if you're trying to get rid of processed meat stick something else in your bolognese or mm. as a burger, you know, you can't go far wrong. Them and lentils mm. combined, I, I think, is what we need to do. And there's also lots of lentils in the book as well, um, pulses, mm -hmm. and this whole concept of high-protein plants, um, the peas, the legumes, you know, the book is packed with those as well. So... And they're all incredibly cheap. So that's, you know, we've talked about this in the past, but people don't realize that, you know, 
you can keep it in your freezer, your bag of frozen peas. There's some great recipes in there that, you know, just po frozen pea fritters or whatever. Incredibly easy to do. And you're getting a high protein, really fresh, uh, high fiber meal. So um, more and more lentils, you know, and, and keeping a, a store cupboard. I think what I learned <coughs> when we were sort of writing this and testing the recipes is how much you can do just by keeping good items in your, yeah. in your kitchen, in your sort of dry shelf. It doesn't have to be all super fresh. Yeah. Uh, if you've got these lots of cans of, of beans, um, uh, lentils, chickpeas, and grains, mm. uh, the odd can of tomatoes or whatever, you know, you can make incredible dishes mm. um, without having to, oh, I can't be bothered to cook because I need to go to the shops which you know we've all been there and then you order the takeaway or you go out and you sort of regret it so hopefully people will read this and think gosh you know there's a we've got a list in here of a sort of the zoe larder if you like mm. of, of things and this will just make people think more about the getting these things and Realizing they don't have to be, de you know, dependent on their supermarket or whatever if they're they're sensible, um, and um, you know, people are frightened to eat less meat. And this is a plant-based book. We we thought about having some meat as side dishes or fish as side dishes, yeah. uh, but in the end, you know, we thought, well, actually, you know. Everyone knows how to fry a steak or a, a chicken or whatever. You don't really need a, if they want to add it to these. But the whole point is these are, you know, the, it's converting people from having meat at the center of their, their plates to plants. And, you know, you've got 100 recipes here where the, the plants are the, the big deal. Mm. And many of them have super umami tastes so that you think you're sort of eating, you know, meat-like flavors. And uh, I think this is this is the what you need to do to if you want to make that switch. And I think many people listening will say, "Oh yeah, but I still like my meat." You know, and I, well, you know, what I did when I switched over is, you know, I went vegan for six weeks. Uh -huh. uh, so I was forced to do this. Um, it only lasted six weeks. <laughs> I, lo I love cheese, but um, I think you, you know. Even if it's only two weeks of saying I'm going to go without meat and I'm going to try these dishes, that will tell you that you you know you can cut down your meat intake without problems. You don't have to go fully vegetarian, but I think you realise what you're missing. Yeah, if you're only sticking a big slab of meat on your your plate with a few peas or carrots around it every day. Yeah, and I think that's you're missing that diversity. You're missing those different flavours. And uh, you know spices and herbs, and it just makes it so much easier. Yeah, I think what you mentioned about the umami flavor is really important there because when you start introducing things like miso, soy, mushrooms, tomatoes, even they do have these natural umami flavors that can make you sort of uh, what well, can satiate that craving for for meat. Um, it is a plant based book, I believe. It, it, in entirety, there's no cheese or nothing like that. Well, plant-based, uh, no, there is cheese. Oh, there's some cheese. Okay. But there's, <laughs> yeah, but there's always an option, you know, to yeah. for, for a vegan to, to swap it out for, you know, yeast or gotcha. uh, tofu or, or whatever it is. But, um, but there were some lovely other swaps in there. There was, um, instead of bechamel sauce, yeah. which I used to love on lasagna, we've come up with a, a tofu and white bean mm. puree that works brilliantly. Uh, we stopped, swapped the standard stock cube, mm -hmm. which, although it's in small amounts, is, you know, theoretically an ultra-processed product uh, for miso paste. Mm. And miso is, you know, a fantastic fermented soy and very natural, and we should be more having more of it. So hopefully that will improve miso sales uh, around the country. But also just make you people think about what they're putting in it. And it's actually even more... As you said, umami than yeah. a standard stock cube. Yeah. Um, so lots of little swaps like this that I think people will take as habits long term, and I yeah. think that that's really important. And and they're all 
virtually all of them, you know, rapid um, meals. And, and, you know, you've been into this for a while about how people, how easy it is to make these, these sort of dishes. Mm. Uh, once you once you get into it, yeah. Uh, but you just got to bite the bullet and say, okay, let's you know, let's get going. Stock up your larder, you know, get all these things, and then once you've got them, really, it's it's no time at all. Yeah, it takes a, just a bit of practice, and I think the inspiration you've got in the cookbook is is fab. Even my wife today struggles to fathom how I make dishes from pretty much nothing in the fridge. And I'm just looking at the store cupboard, and it's Things like you said, you know, tomato puree, uh, lentils that can be cooked within 20 minutes, the the red split lentil variety. It's sort of encouraging people to think about their kitchens in a different way rather than just relying on the sort of meat and veg on the, on the side. O- on the subject of, of meat and fish, do you still eat meat and fish yourself? And, and how do you think about sort of dose, quality and, and quantity? So I had about seven or eight years without eating meat I, I did eat fish occasionally mm. uh, I got a I, I was struggling with b12 deficiency which I've always had low levels pretty much all my life anyway and uh, so I thought you know what well, I'm, I'm sick of I don't want to you know go to injections and sure yeah so I'll start eating uh, meat once or twice a month and I've always eaten dairy um, not excessively but I don't drink milk, but mm. I have fermented dairy and, mm. and eggs. And um, I found that that helped. I quite enjoyed having meat. I usually have a, a bit of my wife's steak rather than the whole steak. Sure. I, I find it quite hard to have the same portions I used to have. Mm. You know, I do enjoy tasting things. And I think I found it important that if I was writing books on food or cookbooks that I wasn't seen as too extreme, so I could talk to people what it, you know, about cooking meat or without it having some religious fervor about it. Because I'd be very happy if, you know, there were no vegetarians on the planet, but you know, we all ate meat, you know, once a week as a special treat. And I think we ought to be thinking more in those sort of terms. Yeah it's easier to convert people to that concept that they don't have to give up things. Yeah. And our general, my view and the view of Zoe is that, you know, nothing should be completely off the table. Sure. There's always an event or a rare thing that you should say, okay, this is a, a time for this. You know, I might even one day have orange juice, you know, um, <laughs> uh, and my special K again as a, to see what it tastes like. You know what I mean? It's like... I think you should still be able to do that. And that, yeah. that's this this idea behind meat. So, but when I do eat meat, you know, I won't eat cheap processed meat. Sure. I'd never eat, you know, the standard minced meat you get uh, in the UK or mm. a cheap burger or something. Because mm. um, not only that, I actually prefer a, a mushroom and lentil burger now. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, really good bit of Kobe beef occasionally or incredible bit of venison just to savor it and taste it i still will enjoy that but i know i don't want it yeah uh, more than you know occasionally fish i eat not as much as i used to because um you know i know that the benefits of eating fish are a bit over hyped and that there's a real sustainability problem about fish as well yeah. so um i go more for the mussels and clams Mm-hmm. that are sustainable and i also really enjoy and they're they're pretty pretty healthy for you for you and the planet as well when you think about meat and fish with the exception of protein um or highly accessible protein do, do you think there are any additional benefits of having meat and fish in one's diet even if it is you know once or even a couple of times a month we've done some studies Comparing omnivores, vegetarians, and vegans, interestingly, uh, on th- about 30,000 people across the US and the UK. And the paper should be out soon. But the upshot was that on average, vegetarians and vegans have healthier guts than omnivores. Mm-hmm. But that the healthiest people were, were 
people who ate a lot of plants and a few um, had occasional meat and fish. Gotcha. Mm. The divert, well, I say healthiest, what, what we're calling a healthy gut, which they had greater number of species, mm -hmm. greater ratio of, of uh, good bugs to bad bugs. Okay. So it's possible, so a vegan will have less species in their gut than an omnivore. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that that will be a, a slight advantage. So there might be the sweet spot that, you know, evolution is intended for us is to have the occasional bit of extra meat or fish protein in mm. our diets that encourages other microbes to survive who can produce alternate chemicals mm. to that that a, a pure, very strict vegan would have. Gotcha. But it's, it's a nuance. Yeah. You know, I, I, let's not forget that vegetarians and vegans are you know, quite a way healthier than the average omnivore. Yeah. But there might be this little type of omnivore, this flexitarian mm. that I like to think myself as, yeah. that might be in that, in that niche. So we need to do more work on it. This is the first big study of its kind. But uh, I think we don't know whether you know, those particular microbes that you get in meat eaters versus uh, pure vegans how beneficial they are yet so it's more a theoretical exercise yeah it's funny you were talking about your anecdote with your with your wife and having a bit of a steak that's literally what happened to me last night because my wife's pregnant and she's having we, we generally eat mainly plants during the week with a bit of fish but she's been having cravings for, for steak and that's literally what i had <laughs> last night but my i think my gut microbes aren't used to having red meat anymore because i feel heavy the next day mm. and i just you know, a little bit of bloating and, you know, just my microbes clearly haven't adapted quick enough to, to accept. No, well, they're, it's, they're in for a bit of a shock, aren't they? Yeah. They get a big slab of steak down there. I said, what's this guy doing? You know, um, he told us to go on holiday. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so I think that's, that's really a, a, an interesting message that once you do have less meat, you, you, you need, you, you're satiated by much less of it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that's probably because you, and it, it's a bit like people who don't eat many vegetables, you know, and you get all these people that said, oh, I can't, I can't eat vegetables. They give me bloating and, exactly. you know, uh, and constipation. I feel terrible. Well, you need to build up your microbes so they can digest those pulses and, you know, these high fiber foods that, that we're talking about. So mm -hmm. I think it, it works across, across the board, really, that. Things you're not used to eating, you know, might cause you some problems if if you don't do it gradually and and build up your your reserves. And we ne we've never thought about digestion in that way. That, yeah. Oh, it's just your acid that breaks it down, and nothing else really matters. But you know, clearly the microbes are, are playing a key role. Yeah, there's a huge army there battling down and breaking down your food. Um, yeah, with regards to your B12, is that, is that something that you're able to manage with food now or do you have to supplement or is it? Uh, yeah, I'm I, I do check it sort of once a year, uh -huh. uh, but I, I can largely manage it with food. Um, I might get a once a year injection or something if I'm low because yeah. I've, I've got high blood pressure. So there's some evidence that low B12 has a, a negative impact on you control your blood pressure. That's mm. why I'm perhaps more fussy than most people. Yeah, 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 yeah. As we it. should be, you know, like even with my own health issues that I had, I'm probably, I feel I have a lower threshold for unhealthy habits than my colleagues. And I think everyone's different. I think, you know, that that's that stands, that's, that's a good testament to that. Um, you mentioned dairy uh, before, uh, with the exception of cheese and aged cheese that I know you're a big fan of. Um, what about regular dairy that most people have in their in their coffee, in their cereal, as a as a drink? Um, what, what are your what are your thoughts on on dairy now? Dairy's interesting. I mean, I think there's no reason for adults to drink dairy. You know, you think about well, cow's breast milk. You know, why would we carry on drinking it? Milk, you know, breast milk, very good for children, designed for rapid growth, etc. Um, all the studies suggest that uh, 
if you have a lot of milk in your diet, you, it doesn't make you healthier, but it does make you grow faster. Mm -hmm. And they've done studies show that actually your bones get longer, but actually more fragile. So we now, all the epidemiology shows that milk drinkers are not protected against fracture. Okay. I used to tell my patients completely the wrong advice. You know, if they were vegans or whatever, I'd say, oh, you really need to do something about this because you're not having milk. Mm. No evidence really that, you know, unless they've got other vitamin deficiencies that they're, they're, they're in trouble. So this myth that milk and calcium were really important for our bone health has been disproven by all the, the latest epidemiology and trials. So we shouldn't be seeing it as a health drink um i think we shouldn't demonize it either okay and so having if you have a splash of co you know milk in your coffee it's really no consequence mm -hmm. um unless you're lactose intolerant or whatever but um so but i don't think we should be encouraging people to drink pints of milk okay like we used to yes like we used to like i used to mm. um thinking it was going to be good for me there's absolutely no evidence it is, you know, and um, for some people that, you know, it, it, it is going to cause problems. But when you ferment it, it does seem to be good for you. So whether that's as kefir or yogurt or cheese, interestingly. So but it's probably more the microbes in the fermenting that's making it good rather than the basic lactose and um, proteins in the milk. So do you think it would be the consumption of, probiotics in that fermented product versus something to do with the saturated fats or the proteins and how they coagulate in that fermented product so what would i guess another way of asking you would be if you were to have um kefir made from milk and kefir made from coconut or water would you have the same benefits to the to the person uh, it's hard to answer that. I mean, because you get different microbes in the two and you okay. it, they haven't managed to work out to get microbes that grow in coconut as easily as they mm. do in milk. So lots of microbes prefer milk to coconut. So mm. it's tougher. Um, but I, I suspect that the main effect is, is having the right number of microbes rather than the substrate. Okay. Um, so that's 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 my hunch anyway. So, but it means that if you can get the similar similar ones growing in coconut, it should be just as good for you. Yeah. And and there are there are data that um, water kefirs, for example, uh, fruit fruit kefirs or tibicos, are you know have a lot of the same benefits as as the milk kefirs mm. if you you know, um, if you're doing similar types of studies. So I think we're going to see more of those non-dairy ones because, you know, 80% of the pop of the world's population don't have the enzyme to break down lactose. Mm. And um, this is very much a Western sort of dominated idea. And although fermentation breaks, you know, breaks it into smaller fragments and things, there's still some people who are a bit sensitive sure. uh, to it. So I think we're going to be seeing more of the, the non-milk products. And, you know, and increasingly for the planet, if you can have a, a really good non-milk product, fermented food, we should be switching to it. You know, we shouldn't be encouraging keeping, you know, billions of cows uh, to provide us with their breast milk. It yeah. seems a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, coffee. We, we mentioned coffee a couple of times now. We've both just had our coffees ourselves. Very nice coffee. Yeah. Clearly, you're you're a coffee drinker and you're a coffee fan. Uh, what, what what do we know now about what have you learned about coffee since you started writing your books? Um, well, I mean, since I've, I first my, I wrote my first paper on coffee uh, actually in about 1981. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well before you were born, yeah, so, um, yeah. <laughs> um, saying that it caused cancer of the pancreas. <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> so I spent the rest of my career trying to make up for that yeah. <laughs> dreadful mistake. Gotcha. Well, that got into the Lancet, so it helped my career. Wow. My early career as a, I was a student then, but um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So we, coffee's gone through these cycles of it's a demon drink, it's mm. a great drink, it's a demon drink. It's going to be, you know, typical Daily Mail headlines. Sure, of, yeah. Uh, it, it causes cancer, it cures cancer. At the moment, all the evidence suggests that apart from a, a f small fraction of people that don't get on with it, it's really healthy. Mm -hmm. And that you reduce heart disease by about 20 to 30% if you take, uh, have two or three cups a day. Okay. And it looks like up to five cups a day is still healthy. Okay. They used to really worry about the caffeine and mm. all these problems, but that's not been borne out by any of the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's because it's a high fiber, high polyphenol drink that uh, has properties that we don't really understand what they are, but it because there's so many different components to it. And it also seems to be helpful if it's decaffeinated. So it's not the caffeine that's that's causing the particularly the heart benefit. Okay, so this is good news for people who you know uh, can tolerate the taste, don't like the caffeine. Mm. They can have high quality decaf and get some benefits. Um, so yeah, I, I think I recommend everyone treat it as a plant. It is a fermented plant, yeah. and we ought to just see it as one of the you know thirty a week. It's an easy one to tick off for us uh, yeah. that we've got. But you know, I think it's it's giving it its status as a as a, a plant health food uh -huh. rather than this evil cancer inducing stuff that, you know, I used to think it was. And what really fascinating, we've got a, um, a paper coming out sh showing that there's one microbe that we've all got in this country uh -huh. um, called Lawsonobacter. Lawsonobacter. That is the fussiest microbe uh, in Christendom. Because it 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 only uh, eats coffee, <laughs> really, and it's so fussy, and because there's so many coffee drinkers, um, coffee drinkers have high levels of Lawsonobacter, uh -huh. and when you don't drink coffee, it drops around to really minimal levels, but doesn't disappear. So it's hanging around in some sort of suspended animation in most in people. And it's in the air because if you live with coffee drinkers, uh, you might kiss a coffee drinker or, you know, you're exchanging saliva mm. or whatever. You know, after a few years, babies don't have it, but eventually they will get this microbe. And it just sits there waiting for you to drink coffee. And then it goes wild wow. and expands. And it's the strongest association we've found at Zoe between a, a food substance and a specific microbe. Uh -huh. And it... It's a lovely story, um, and uh, it, it, and it's interesting because this doesn't exist in non-coffee drinking countries, really? and doesn't exist in babies. So it's it's really a sort of cultural thing that we've we've brought on, and that, and there's a similar story about seaweed eating microbes in Japan, but it this is a really nice one. It, but it gives us the idea that once you've got these big studies like. You know, we've got this is based on 35, 50,000 people, but once we've got 200,000 people, we can start looking at other food microbe associations like this and so really track mm. what these are doing. Um, so I think it's like the first of many, but it was that was quite a cool thing to suddenly learn about this, um, this fussy coffee loving microbe. That's so, so funny. Uh, when you think it's just been there, and, and you know, where did it come from? Yeah, you know. How does it get into humans? All these kind of weird stories that just make me more fascinated about the gut microbes and, you know, this whole world that we know nothing about. Yeah. And, you know, could this be, and could the micro be producing, you know, these chemicals that then interact with our immune system, that then you know, help us uh, reduce inflammation and fight heart disease? You know, we don't know. Gosh. But, you know, it could lead to some new medications and... Um, treatments yeah you know, they're just you know food is medicine idea just gets you know stronger and stronger doesn't it yeah absolutely and i guess that's the sort of like thread of this whole conversation of 
food as medicine is something that you, you've you've really become a proponent on over the course of your career. I think when I started, certainly at med, at med school, you know, it's, no one was really talking about food in a medicinal context, but but now it's really galvanizing um, popular. Yeah, and the first I heard it, there were these sort of alternate practitioners yeah. talking about it. I thought they were all nutters. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest, you know, and I think most of my medical colleagues regarded anyone who said that yeah. as bonkers. Yeah. Uh, or snelling, selling steak, snake oil, um, you know, and uh, now, yeah, there's me saying you know, exactly that, mm. that it is the most powerful medicine we've got and we're just not using it right. Mm. And um, everyone needs to, to realise that that potential. And by understanding how it all works, I think you, you get a, you can move away from the sort of lectin type scare story mm. and start, really thinking about you know your own body and, and and all the different chemicals going on in there and how it's ridiculous to talk, to single out one or get obsessed with it and th you know think about the thousands of chemicals you need to be pumping out and your body is a is a pharmacy that uh, and your microbes are all mini pharmacies that you need to feed with the right ingredients and um, that way you you can avoid some of these pitfalls of people taking you down you know blind alleys and, and things like this this is the only yeah cause of this disease this is the reason you've got this this is you know I, I you can never eat this all these sort of rigid rules that are basically complete rubbish yeah um we, we've really talked about those six concepts in your in your book around this conversation you talked about the the diversity eating the rainbow polyphenols etc etc um pivoting your protein um, one thing I, I thought we could finish up on is uh, this idea of um, time-restricted eating, something that you mentioned that you do right at the start. What kind of window are we talking about? And do you think that someone's fasting regime, quote-unquote, <cling> is different from, from person to person? Do you think someone would benefit from a 16-8 uh, uh, window versus a 12-12 window? Do you think there are variations in, in how one responds? So the studies that have been done on time restricted eating, obviously you're all using volunteers. They're all keen to do it. Sure. It's not just taking people off the street at random and doing it. So you get the selected audience and they get told what to do and they're often in the US, they're paid to do it and, and to complete. So you don't really know how easy or hard it is to do these things. Mm. And that's why I'm a bit skeptical about these small randomized trials about what that really means because um, those studies do show that yes if you can fast for 16 hours and you can do it so you don't eat after 5 p.m or mm. something you get the sort of maximum benefits yeah um but you know is that applicable to real life can you sustain that and we did looked at exactly that um with zoe we we asked 140,000 people to take part in this so a citizen science study, they all, they all agreed to do uh, time restricted eating with a 14 hour window, uh, which we thought was a sort of pragmatic middle ground and some studies have shown that that works uh, nearly as well. Um, a third managed it quite easily. A third didn't. Just said once, once they were told they had to start, oh, I'm not doing that. And a third sort of half did it, found it tough, you know, uh, and, and so didn't totally adhere to the protocol. Gotcha. So I think that gives you a flavor about, you know, how many people will find it really easy to do this. I mean, I find it really easy. My wife finds it really tough. Uh, Jonathan Wolf, mm. you know, CEO Zoe, yeah. can't cope with it. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> so I think we have to realize there's a personalized element sure. to it. And it's, and it's, you know, some of it's how hungry do you feel as soon as you wake up? Yeah. I don't feel hungry when I wake up. Some people do. Mm. You've got to respect that difference. Yeah. You know, we're talking about personalization. I think exactly that goes into it. So I think all we can really say is, uh, you know, try it, give it a go. If it suits you, it's going to be dead easy, mm. a really easy way to improve your mood, your energy. We found that the, th the third of people, the 30-odd thousand that did it, they lost weight, 
they improved their mood, their energy levels, uh, they had less gut symptoms, mm -hmm. things like heartburn improved, interestingly, um, bloating improved, but it's not for everybody. Sure. And the important thing is you need to sustain this for years and decades to be of use. And it, you probably need to do it at least five days out of seven. Mm -hmm. But even if you did it a couple of days, it's probably still helpful. Yeah. Other smaller studies have suggested that although the microbes improve and you get tidying up your microbiome, the weight loss is mainly due to thinking about uh, snacking more. Okay. And avoiding that late night snack. Yeah. Which not only is bad for your gut, but you know adds un unneeded calories and things. Yeah. Uh, which you, if you're just thinking more logically. Yeah. Uh, it's not a problem. And, it, and it, it's getting out of the British culture of sort of eating all the time. Yeah. Which you don't get in, you know, I spend a lot of time in Spain and nobody there really snacks. They'll go long periods of time waiting for their, their big meal. Mm. And so everything's around those meal times. So they would snack around those meal times, but not, you know, two yeah. hours before it or two hours after it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You just make sure you eat enough of that, those, those meal times. So I think that was a really useful insight into sort of a pragmatic advice about yeah. time restricted eating so i say to people try it you know try and not eat after your main meal you know there's a big habit in many british households of you know a bit of cake and biscuits <laughs> yeah. you know as you're watching telly yeah. 10 o'clock at night yeah with your tea or whatever that's a really bad idea yeah yeah One um, of the worst things. have that you know, right as your dessert, you know, have it with your meal. Mm. Uh, or eat more for your meal if you're going to feel peckish afterwards. You know, you're not eating enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that's a better way of doing it. But, yeah, it, it's interesting. So try it, but don't assume everyone should do it and don't feel a failure if it's not for you. Yeah. And it's super sound advice. And I, I'm one of those people who don't feel hungry in the morning, which is why for me fasting is actually a great tool. I can train fasted. I have my my meal like mid morning, um, sometimes even later. Just I sort of I'm very intuitive about it. I just kind of gauge how I feel that day. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's nice to know that there's the research that shows that it's not for everyone, and you've really got to be you know responsible and, and um, take ownership yourself as to whether you you want to engage in it or not. Um, I'm going to bring this conversation to a close, but let, let's dive in. Let's dive into fermented foods because this is one of the things that um, is a big part of the book. And I think you and I both are big fans of trying to get, you know, pickles, ferments, more probiotics into the diet in interesting ways rather than just relying on supplements that are being sold everywhere. Yeah, so there's lots of recipes. I haven't counted how many that include ferments and nearly all of them have a, you can always add in sauerkraut, kimchi, yeah. uh, whatever. There's there's three salad dressings that are all got ferments in them. So rather than just your oil and vinegar, you know, we've got a, a kimchi dressing, we've got a sauerkraut dressing, we've got a kefir, milk mm. kefir dressing, so that you can actually add it to all your salads. And there were lots of ways where you can just fold, you know, sauerkraut and kimchi into many many of these dishes um obviously you know, we talked about miso um obviously if you're cooking with miso it's going to kill it off but you know leaving some to stir in at the end and where it's still warm is, is absolutely fine and of course we're both big fans of adding kefir particularly the curries and things like this mm. right at the end so swirling it around or adding a topping or even just you know, sticking a bit of uh, yogurt with with lime on, on top of things, and, yeah. and you just realise that well, actually, there's no reason to not do that on every meal. Mm. And so I've got into the habit now of doing this, and you just need to make sure you've got you know your big pots of your your sauerkraut, your your, your kimchi, and your and your kefir and your yogurt that you can add to everything, and that way you know that. Um, you know, you're going to get your ferments in. The latest evidence suggests that you know having at least three portions of ferments is is guaranteed to improve your immune system mm. in in just a couple of weeks. Wow! And so 
particularly with people worried about infections and the flus and COVID and or taking antibiotics, you know, this is just such an easy way to to cover your balance and make the foods more interesting and, and tasty and more complex with, you know, especially when you're adding the, the krauts in. Yeah. Uh, or the kimchi, you're, you're getting different textures and things. There. And, uh, and I think it's a great way to introduce kids to uh, fermented foods is by folding them into other foods. Yeah. So they're not just there with, with that potentially sort of dangerous sourness or, or spiciness, but you can just mix them in. So more and more I've been mixing these, these ferments in with other foods. And so far, there haven't been any disasters, you know, because <laughs> I thought, well, maybe there'll be something that'll be, just be horrible. Yeah. But I don't know whether, whether you've found any, but I've, I've not actually sort of um, found anything that, that doesn't work. No, uh, we, we've got like a, in the kitchen, I'll show you, we've got a little fermentation station. It's like a little cupboard that we, we keep with all our ferments bubbling away for weeks and weeks, and then we put them in the fridge. And luckily, touch wood, we've we've been fine. Nothing's actually exploded or anything like that. Oh, I did have one explosion oh, yeah. when I was when I was testing some of these things. Uh, unfortunately, it was a, a bottle. Um, <laughs> um, it, it didn't break, but I opened it. Yeah, and uh, basically, this uh, it was it was a water cafe with lemon ginger and turmeric uh -huh. and it hit the ceiling oh gosh turmeric and so i've got turmeric stains <laughs> on my kitchen ceiling because if you look up you, it's impossible to get it off so that's that's probably the main sort of uh downside but you, you don't you're not going to get exploding uh sauerkraut to the same no, uh, well, no. it's the same thing so i don't want to put people off for sure yeah <laughs> what's your preferred method for making krauts and stuff like i, I use a two percent lactation method i think it's called yeah, I, mean, I think that's the standard one. Is two uh, percent is two percent is the minimum amount of salt. So it makes it dead easy mm. if you just say all you got to do is weigh whatever your your plant is, your cabbage or your um, uh, radish, mm -hmm. and mix it with two percent minimum salt. You don't want to mm -hmm. go below that because mm -hmm. below that you don't get the right conditions. You can mm -hmm. get other microbes in it. So two two and a half. Um, sometimes for for my uh, when I'm doing kimchi, I will add three percent and then okay. slightly rinse it. Okay. Uh -huh. um, but it, it means you bring it down to two percent. Sure. So I think two percent in general. That's everyone should learn that. Mm -hmm. Just make sure your maths is good when mm. you when you're weighing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you don't get it wrong. Um, and that way, it's not too super salty. Yeah. And uh, it just it works for everything. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I seem to be like two percent for salt and. I don't know for my kept my uh, drinks, you know, so the the kombuchas, the water kefirs, yeah. You know, so five percent sugar seems to work pretty well. So yeah. it's a once you get these figures in, it, everything else becomes very easy. It's about the only thing you need to remember. Totally, yeah. You know, and um, I want everyone to be able to make a, a you know a sauerkraut. Um, it's it's so easy. Chop up a bit of cabbage. Mas massage it with two percent salt stick it in a jar i mean you that's know it. Yeah, you don't yeah. get much easier than that totally yeah no we love experimenting with different ferments at home and stuff and just folding them into meals and, and adding them to the, the side as well um we're going to do a quick quick fire round just to end up i know you could talk about each of these subjects for ages um alcohol what are your thoughts on alcohol Have they change do you think it's you know this whole red wine phenomena uh is it is it actually true or are you sort of on the side of pure abstinence? Um, I practice what I preach, so I drink. So okay. I can't, uh, I, what I would say is that um, different people respond to alcohol differently. So mm -hmm. give alcohol a rest every now and again and see how you feel. If it mm -hmm. dramatically improves your life, you know that you're much better off without it. Um, you can always reduce our alcohol um, you know, you don't want to be having headaches and feeling bad. So I've certainly reduced the amount of alcohol I have. I have one alcohol-free day a mm -hmm. week. But I found when I actually uh, had a couple of weeks without alcohol, it didn't transform my life. Sure. And I have friends who it has transformed their life. So mm -hmm. I think, again, it's there is a personal response to this. And if you are going to drink alcohol, um, have small amounts, have 
as much red wine as you can um, because it is the one that does help your gut microbes. Artisan cider is an alternative because it has very high polyphenol levels. Ah. Again, you've got the apple in there. Mm. Um, I do get a lot of criticism about my uh, love of red wine, but, you know, it's one of the joys in life as well. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit like the, your joy of tastes. It's a unique taste. And I don't think we should be depriving ourselves of this. It's also, if you can have small amounts of alcohol and that encourages you to go out and be sociable, that's important for your longevity. So, again, it's it's trying to get that balance right, not tell people off, not say you can never have things. Mm. Um, yeah, you have it in moderation. But increasingly, there are lots of, I'm drinking more and more, um, these low alcohol mm. uh, beers. I've tried low alcohol wines, they're not very good yet. Mm. Uh, but some of these zero alcohol cocktails are fantastic. Yeah. So I, this whole field is exploding. And five years ago, you know, zero alcohol beers were disgusting. Now I tell you, you know, countries like Germany and, and Spain have incredible range yeah. of them and, and they're like 30% of the market. Yeah. So. I think we're going to see more and more of these um, uh, g going forward that allow you to be sociable and have actually having less less of the harmful alcohol, but more of the sort of ta similar taste benefits. Totally. I got introduced to a friend of mine, Cami Vidal, uh, who is, uh, she's French and she's a mixologist. She worked for Bacardi and all the big brands. And now she focuses on no and low alcohol and she's mm. she rates them. She's one of these sort of uh, judges for the no and low uh, awards every year. She's phenomenal. Um, and she's really changed my opinion on how good non-alcoholic cocktails can be and the, mm. just the, the breadth of it. Um, olive oil. Uh, what are your thoughts on cooking with olive oil? Fantastic. Don't need anything else yeah. <laughs> unless you're making a coconut curry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, don't don't be don't listen to all those scare stories by, you know, big food companies that want you to buy their um, highly processed blend of other stuff. You know, study after study have shown that it's perfect for for cooking. Mm. It's perfect for putting on your salads. We should be having much much more of it and. Don't worry about all this nonsense about smoke points. It's all rubbish. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite ultra processed foods? Favorite ultra processed foods? Uh, I would. Uh, it's probably something you haven't been asked many times. <laughs> As a kid, I, I used to love Jaffa cakes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm partial to a Jaffa cake Gosh, if someone would so often ages. offer me one. At yeah. least remind you of the past. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, I'll still eat uh, some of the ultra processed crisps. Okay. I now avoid the worst ones. So I'll try and you can get pretty much non ultra processed crisps now. You know, if you get one of those expensive Spanish brands that have been made with olive oil and oh, yeah, I only have the mean. potato and mm, things in them. You pay yeah. a fortune for them, but, yeah. <laughs> but you, 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 know, you get, they're really good taste. Really good. <laughs> but a, a salt and vinegar, you know, a packet of Walker's salt and vinegar, I, I will still gobble down, you know. Um, <laughs> and I guess the one I'm, I'm most tempted by uh, is something like a, in summer, a Magnum ice cream or yeah. something like that. And I know it's not good for me, but I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a rare treat. Yeah, totally. Uh, I appreciate your honesty. I completely concur with all those choices. Those are brilliant. <laughs> I'm just glad I'm not surrounded. You know, I don't work at a, at a sweet shop or something. But. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be really careful about what I surround myself with because I, I know what my my sort of um, uh, my limits are. Like I have to be very intentional about what I have in my kitchen. Um, on the subject of uh, UPS, we're going to make some cookies in the kitchen now, but not not an ultra-processed version now. <laughs> some from your book. So uh, yeah, I'll be able to watch that on YouTube for any folks listening. Um, but yeah, appreciate your time, Tim. This has been wonderful. I can't wait to the fourth time. It's been great fun. <laughs> totally enjoy it. If you loved that episode, you will love the full library of podcasts from the Doctor's Kitchen Library. We talk about everything from inflammation, supplements, and food as medicine. Just like this episode right here, you can click it right now and check it out.